Howdy, everyone. Howdy. All right, my goal in having uh, Dr. Richard Lester here today was to kind of initiate an effort to offer SRPH students not only an introduction to entrepreneurship, but kind of what resources are, would be available to you guys, um, and also provide uh, eventually some basic knowledge and hopefully inspire some of you to make impacts in public health through innovation and entrepreneurial pursuits. Um, Dr. Lesser is the Executive Director of the Center for New Ventures of Entrepreneurship uh, in the Department of Management at the Mays Business School. Uh, he holds uh, the title of Clinical Associate Professor. He has a PhD in Strategic Management from Mays Business School from Texas A&M, an EMBA from the University of Houston, and a Bachelor of Science from Wright State University. Um, so I think without further ado, I'm going to introduce Dr. Lester. Thank you. Howdy. Howdy. Hi, Mark. Yeah, I feel like I'm preaching to the crowd with uh, Dr. Benden here. So he's, he's, a, he's about as prolific uh, entrepreneur as we can uh, ever hope to be around. So uh, my name is Dick Lester. I'm with the uh, Mays Business School. Pretty, uh, pretty happy to be here. I, uh, uh, every time I get an opportunity to uh, stole the virtues of entrepreneurship and talk about it a little bit, uh, I usually take that opportunity um, quite well. So Chris, thanks for the invitation. And, and all of the folks are here, I'm really... Uh, Appreciate, of course, it's always nice when there's food in the way, so, you know, at least I can, uh, hopefully, we'll draw a little bit of a crowd. So, I, I have a, a couple uh, goals today. I want to talk about the Center for New Ventures and Entrepreneurship. I kind of want to let you know what it is. Um, sometimes I came over to see Beta, well, I guess, last year, and that was the first time I'd been over this building, and we're right next to each other, so uh, it's really nice to be able to have uh, the relationship over here. I want to talk a little bit about entrepreneurship and, and how it might impact you and getting you to think a little bit about entrepreneurship maybe a little differently than what you have before. And then I want to give you some opportunities to get you involved uh, with our center, with the activities that we do, and get you involved in, in kind of entrepreneurial activities that happen around campus. So this is our center. Um, we are housed in the business school, but we pretty much see ourselves as a multi-college uh, center. Uh, the majority of the things that we do are for students all across campus, so it's, it's definitely not aimed at only business students. Uh, fact is, and I can, I can poke fun at business students because I am one, we're not the most creative animals in the world, so a lot of times we need folks from other schools to come in and help us get those creative juices going. Um, I'm going to talk to you about a few of these programs uh, later on towards the end of it that I think could really be of interest to you, that also could uh, probably enhance and spark some of your entrepreneurial thinkings. So, most of you in this room don't have a clue what that is. It's, there's a couple in here, but this is a typewriter. And, uh, and E.B. Hess uh, started the Royal Typewriter Company in 1906. And, and I like the Royal Typewriter Company because my mother was an English teacher in middle school and she had a Royal Typewriter, uh, a Royal Typewriter just like this one. Anyway, EB started this company in 1906 and very quickly by the early 1920s was the most prolific and innovative typewriter company in the United States. They had more patents under their belt than every other typewriter company combined in the United States. Now, it begs the question, why in the world isn't the Royal Typewriter Company Dell Computer? Why isn't it the wang of the day, right? Why didn't it turn into telecommunications? What they were doing was putting words on a piece of paper, right? They're taking a, a you hit a lever, puts a letter on a piece of paper, and you create documents and words. So here's a company that by the 1960s was virtually bankrupt. They were bought by IBM. IBM had a way of buying bankrupt companies and making them worse than what they were <laughs> at that time. And, and they did, they, went, they became worse, and there actually is still the royal name out there a little bit. I think I saw a cash register that had the royal typewriter name on it, the royal, royal name on it. Why do you think this company didn't innovate and become a much more successful company when semiconductors and things came out? This is an open question, so. This is the audience participation part of this presentation. Why do you think that's the case? Okay, so not really understanding the macro environment that was out there in front of them. Very good. What else? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. 
What they saw about putting a letter on a piece of paper was a mechanical transformation. So when they hired people, they hired mechanical engineers. They had folks that said, well, we can make this lever a little bit better. We can make it go a little bit faster. We can make sure that QWERTY keyboard looks just right. We can make it prettier. But when electronics came out and semiconductors came out, they didn't have a clue. And so you can be very innovative. If you don't look for the uh, macro environmental changes that are happening in your world, and you don't think about having the right kind of people on your team, no matter how innovative you were, doesn't necessarily think that you're going to be innovative and successful in the future. What public corporate, you can't answer, Mark. What public corporations R&D facility inver invented virtually every aspect of today's personal computer? They invented the GUI interface, the mouse, the laser printer, computer networking, internet, bitmap graphics, email, and a PC. What company did all that? <laughs> no. They did some of it, there's no doubt. No. <laughs> only, only, the, uh, only the internet protocol. Yeah. This ought to be the most valuable company in the history of the world, right? They invented everything. It's Xerox. They set up, they had a very visionary CEO named McCullough. And in the 60s, Xerox owned 80% of the market share in copiers. And they were growing at 40% a year. Huge, right? And what, they, what McCullough decided was that the office of the future, this is the 60s, you know, the, the future would have been 70s and 80s, right? So the office of the future was going to be very different than what the office of today. And so he created the Palo Alto Research Center, PARC, which is now right in the middle of Silicon Valley. And he took the best researchers and the best scientists that he could find, and he plunked them down in Silicon Valley. And he said, create the office of the future. And so he did. They did. They created all of this stuff. And then they invited in folks like Steve Jobs and said, look at what we created. And they looked at that and said, holy smokes, that's good stuff. They invited Bill Gates in. And he looked at it and said, well, this is really good stuff. The thing that they didn't do was they didn't set any of the intellectual property on any of this. They created all this stuff. So you can have great ideas, great inventions, but if you can't execute, you're no better than Royal Typewriter Company who misses out on opportunities. So the execution for that was critical. So how many of you want to be your own boss? A few, OK, good, all right. So the thing that you can do about that is start thinking about what is it that I can do in my career that's going to allow me to be successful in that endeavor. How many of you think if you're not going to be the boss, you're going to be working for a small growth company? Not many of you. Actually, many of you probably will. Now, I've got to tell you that I don't, I don't know your, your, your school and, and the programs really well. I've got a little bit of knowledge of it. But, the majority of people are going to end up working for small, high-growth, fast companies anymore. That's where the net new jobs are coming from. There's a survey that's out. It's called the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor. It's done by, the, um, it's done by Babson University and the London Business School. And what they've done for the last 15, 20 years is go out and they survey 42 different countries. And they're looking for who, what country is the most entrepreneurial in the world. Well, then, of course, it's, it's comparative, right? It's relative one to another. And one of the things that they found is there's 400, and these are actual surveys. These are boots on the ground. They go talk to people. And they found out there's 460 million peoples around the globe that are actually interested and in, in engaged in entrepreneurial activity. A third of those are due to necessity. So you've got some really poor uh, folks and some really devastated reasons that if they're not entrepreneurial, they're not eating. It might be a chicken farm, or it might be an organic garden, or it might be any kind of garden. And if they're not doing something like that, they're not going to eat and they're not going to be able to feed their family. But two-thirds of those are for opportunity. They're out there seeking opportunities in different ways around the world. 
The other thing that came out of this survey over the years is that they create what's called the total entrepreneurial activity, the TEA is a number that they created. And the one thing that that shows is that TEA is strongly associated with economic growth. So countries with higher entrepreneurial activity have higher economic growth in those countries. Financial support, which is one of the things that's really helped the United States, the venture capital, the angel investors, the banking system has provided significant resources to the entrepreneurial community, and education. Those folks that actually participate in and learn about entrepreneurship while they can and have the ability to are going to be much more successful. This is just a, a look at the country and some of the countries that they did. It gets a little unwieldy when you try to do all of it. But the world average is 10.6. This is their TEA number. Right? United States is just barely above the average. And this was uh, 10 years from 2001 to 2010. We've got some countries that are probably poor, developing worlds, that probably are much more um, entrepreneurship is for necessity. They've got to do things. But all around the world, there's significant pockets of countries that are interested in spurring on economic activity. It gets down to property rights, having adequate financing, good educational systems. Those all spur economic activity. But the one thing you can show is that, one thing that they show, is that higher total economic activity results in higher economic growth for the country. OK, so what is entrepreneurship? It's a process of opportunity seeking without regard to resources currently controlled. So that's kind of an academic um, definition. It's in new ventures. It's for profit, not for profit. It's in existing entities, for profit, not for profit. And it's in, exhibited by individuals in pursuit of their goals. So when we say without regard to resources currently controlled, what do you think we're talking about? Think about yourself as an entrepreneur. Think about you want to start a business. And if I told you you can do it without regard to resources currently controlled, what does that mean in your mind? That's exactly right. Or what you have available to you, right? I had, uh, I had the opportunity to have the guy at... Uh, that started uh, Cane's, the chicken finger place next to Lane's. And uh, he was in my class when I taught in Louisiana for a couple years. And uh, he told this story about how he wanted, to, um, he wanted to start this chicken finger place. And he had this, what he thought was this great, you know, grandma's recipe for the dipping sauce. And he figured out he knew how to create these chicken things. And so he goes into the bank and he says, I got this great deal. My dog, that's his dog, is Kane. That's his dog, was here, it's going to be the mascot. Got it all figured out. Goes to the bank, and the bank says, well, you don't have enough money at all. Why would we give you any money? You don't have anything to, to collateral. You don't have anything. So he goes, okay. So he goes to Texas. And he comes over here, and he's a roughneck. He does that for 12 months. Saves up every penny that he can. He goes back to... Um, Baton Rouge, and looks at the banker and says, okay, now I got some money. The guy says, that's not enough. Says, okay. So next he goes to Alaska, and he does the crab fishing thing. If you've ever seen that show, you know, where they go out and it's freezing and all that stuff. And he does that for six weeks and, you know, likes to kill him. Comes back, and the guy says, okay, you got enough money. So they gave him a loan for the other part that he didn't have. But that was really, here's a guy that had a dream and a passion and he was so focused on starting that business, he was not going to let something stand in his way. And it could be money. It could be people. It could be you don't have a skill set that you need that you've got to go acquire. It could be any kind of a resource that you need to start that business. Entrepreneurs traditionally will not let that stand in their way. So ideas come from different ways. So when you think about those of you who aren't, don't want to start your own business, that's perfectly fine, but you're going to go work for organizations that need people with entrepreneurial mindsets. And they need people to think of things a little bit differently. And where ideas come from is usually three places. Trends. So what is a, uh, what is a trend that's in your, 
profession right now? What's, what's some of the things that are going on that are going to change your profession? Healthcare reform, so the Affordable Care Act, right? It's going to change everything. I guess we're not quite sure how all that's going to change, but certainly it's going to change probably everything. Remote health, all right. So certainly technology is going to play a big part in that. All right, so every one of those things, the Affordable Care Act, if it's a, if it's a problem for somebody, it's probably an opportunity for somebody else. If telecommunications is going to be put somebody out of business, Royal Typewriter Company, right? There's going to be a macro shift that's going to allow opportunities to be created. And whether it's inside the organization that you're working for or you look at that and say, holy smokes, I could do that and start your own business, there's opportunities there. The other thing that we look for is gaps in the marketplace. So one of the things we traditionally look is, is the competitor map, right? So we'll, we'll plot all of our competitors out and say, where are they strong? Price, quality, location, features and start thinking about what are the dynamics of our competitors are out there. And when you plot those on a matrix, you'll say, hey, there's a, there's a space open here. You know, that's kind of what Target did when they decided to go out. They, when they went out, they said, oh, the last thing we want to do, we just saw Kmart implode. The last thing we want to do is go head to head with Walmart. So they moved up the price quality a little bit because there wasn't anybody there. And so it's basically the same stuff, right? They're selling trash cans and toilet paper and toothpaste and all that stuff. But what they did was they made their stores a little bit different, they raised their profiles a little bit different, they advertised differently, and they created a different level of customer. And so they saw some white space on the map. The other thing you can do is solve a problem. I used to, uh, I used to do this in my class, and I would talk about uh, what bugs you. And it's actually kind of a, an interesting exercise, although it started getting a little carried away with my students, but, so I stopped doing it. But, the, uh, the, the, the premise is right. If it bugs you, it probably bugs somebody else, right? Now, I've always just hated standing in line. I've never figured out how to make a business out of that, but it just bugs me that I have to stand in line. But there's a lot of things that bug you that might be, you know, access to health care for somebody that's in a rural community. That really bugs me. That's a cause that I want to go after. I want to fix that problem. Whatever that is, if you solve problems, there's value there. Somebody will pay you to solve problems. And it might be the organization you're working at, or it might be something that you decide that you're going to start on your own. Where do you think the ideas for new companies come from? Most of the time, if all of you went out and started a new business, where would that idea come from 63% of the time? From your existing employer. You're going to go work for somebody. And you're going to go work for them, and you're going to say, well, they're really screwing that up. Or here's an opportunity that this organization ought to be going after. And you talk to them about it, and they say, no, we don't have time to mess with that. And you say, OK, I can go do that. Most of the majority of the time, you're going to get your ideas for startups and new innovating thinking from your existing employers. Because you're learning a lot here in college, right? But when you go out and you work for somebody else, you're going to learn a whole lot more. And it's going to be very different. And you're going to see things differently. You're going to see different opportunities. I, I, I say when we talk about ideas, and also that you're going to get from your new employees, there's, there's still this romantic notion that we're going to have the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world or the Steve Jobs of the world, right? But really what typically happens on new ideas for product starts is that they start with hunches. It's not that you wake up one morning or you're taking the shower and it's like, Eureka, I've got it. That rarely ever happens. What typically happens is that you get a bunch of these slow hunches. Stephen Johnson is the, uh, is the author of a book, What Makes Great Ideas, and, and he talks about these collisions of small hunches. So you, you have this idea, and then you go with your, your, your buddy or your friend or your husband or wife, and you sit down and you talk about it. And then you start getting another little group together. And so all, now you're starting to combine all of these little hunches together. And by the time you get all those hunches together, now you've got the, the genesis of a potential idea. This is where most of us live, right? That's our comfort zone. And one of the ways that we define this comfort zone quite often is, is the strength of strong ties. I don't know if you've heard of that, but strong ties, that's your immediate network. 
the folks that that are directly in your those are the ones that are of the Facebook profiles that you got they're the ones that you look at not the other ones and there's only about I saw a study a while back said there's only about 150 that you can put on your Facebook profile that really are strong ties to you. You got 500, the other 350 really are just kind of out there and you just want to check on them every once in a while, make sure what they're doing, see if they're doing something interesting. But those are your weak ties. The strong ties, what happens to them? They think like you, they act like you, you like them because you want to go out with them and quite often those are the ones that think exactly like you do. The actual where the magic happens, according to this picture, is quite often in your weak ties. The friends of your friends of your friends that you get introduced to and they bring a new way of thinking and a new way of communicating to you that you didn't know before. And so if you want to start thinking more entrepreneurially, expand your network. I had a, there was a, an interesting article that talked about uh, Lou Gerstner when he took over to IBM. And IBM was just more bound. I mean, they were, in fact, is they were virtually on the, on, the, on the brink of bankruptcy. They're very, very close to it. And one of the things that it used to be, uh, when I used to walk, walk through airports in the, in the 80s, uh, you could tell an IBMer coming from a mile away because they, well, actually, they were kind of dressed like me except for the purple shirt. They would have blue pants, blue blazer, and a white shirt and a blue tie for the guys. The females were all in blue blazers, blue dress, black shoes. That, so you could always, and they, and they always went in pairs or, or trios, so you could always tell the IBMers when they were coming down. So it was a very, very insular structure. And what he wanted to do was, was break that up because it was killing them. They were very non-innovative at that time. And so he started doing things. He, he started creating uh, cubicle creativity. So he said, shut your door once a day and get out a, a, a wastebasket and start shooting hoops. He said, go out and talk to somebody that's 10 to 20 years older than you than 10 to 20 years that's younger than you. It may not work 20 years for many of this crowd. But find somebody that's outside your circle. He said, go out and take a piece of paper and a pencil and sit outside and just start writing down ideas. So many times it's, it's getting us out of our comfort zone that's going to get us to start thinking and creating this entrepreneurial mindset. And I talk to recruiters. And one of the things that we talk about, and I, and I try to get it through to our students, is that most recruiters don't care that you got a 3.8 or a 3.6 or a 3.4. Now, they might care if you got a 2.0. But most of them don't care if you got that, right? What they care about is what are you bringing? Do you, are you able to think critically through issues? Are you able to think innovatively and creativity? Because they can get people to do accounts and debits and, and the kind of technical skills that you get in college. They can find people to do that. They need people to help them solve problems and to move them in different directions. So the entrepreneurial mindset is not as much about really information, it is about perspective. It's about thinking about things in a little different way. One of the ways that, that I always try to think about this is, is, is if I was going to write a book or I was going to write a research article, right? You start with the end in mind, but you also create all those chapters along the way. How am I going to want to organize this? Entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial thinking is the same way. Think about writing a book. I want this book to be about me and how I'm going to start anew, how I'm going to look at a problem differently, and I'm going to figure it out. And the thing that happens is that causes are so important. And you guys, most of you, are going to go help make the world a better place, right? Business guys, we're just out, you know, we're just making money, right? You guys are going to make the world a better place, right? So, Think what Blake Mikowski did with Tom's. Here was a guy who was just messing around. He's down in South America, and he's out there playing polo with his buddies. And he sees these little kids out there without any shoes. And it, and it struck him. Like it strikes many of you when you see a cause that's important to you, right? And then he saw these shoes that they had down there in South America. And he started selling them. And he was selling them out of his trunk. He was selling them out of his house. He was going door to door and finally turned it into a significant business. And it's a cause. And people will pay more for a cause. And people will join you for a cause. If you have a great cause, you can get followers to join you in that cause. 
So why do we talk about small business? Why do we talk about entrepreneurship? Because it's really important. 64% of all the net new private sector jobs are coming from small businesses. A third of those in the last decade have actually come from Texas. And I know our, our, our governor touts that, but it's actually right. Actually, we've gotten a third of the net new jobs that have come. It's been like five million jobs. We've gotten about a million and a half of them. 50% of the private sector employment is in small business. 70% of all US businesses are sole proprietors. Now, the thing about sole proprietors is it's a one, one man, one woman show. All right, so they've, they've created jobs for themselves, not necessarily somebody else. But that's where the majority of businesses actually are. But these are people that are being entrepreneurial, whether it's through opportunity seeking or whether it's through necessity. So how come businesses don't always succeed? You know, it, it's an interesting dilemma. And, and actually, I think it's kind of a positive story. If you, uh, well, let me ask you a question. I read an article a while back, and it said, it, it gave the statistic for the average tenure of a restaurant in Houston, Texas. So how long do you think the average restaurant in Houston, Texas stays alive? Five years, 1.7. So you think about that and you say, holy smokes, right? This was somebody's dream. Man, I'm going to have the best hamburger. It's going to be on this corner. It's going to be great. We're going to put chili on it. We're going to do all kinds of stuff, right? You're going to put bacon on because everything's better with bacon, right? So we're going to do all kinds of stuff, right? And then two years later, less than two years later, they're belly up, right? Extremely competitive marketplace which means prices are, are significantly depressed. It's a tough, tough industry in which to be in, right? But I think it's a, actually a pretty good story overall for small business and entrepreneurship. Uh, one of the, the uh, an SBA study that came out not too long ago, we traditionally thought that about half of all new startups failed in four years. But they actually started doing some other surveys, and one of the things that they found was there was about 17% of these businesses that actually closed but were successful. So the entrepreneur got tired, like, man, I'm working way too hard working for myself, right? and closed the business. Or just decided didn't want to do it anymore, or got a better job offer somewhere else. But that's not a failure. So 67, almost 2 thirds of the companies that start, I would assume that restaurants are not in that number very well. Almost 2 thirds of the businesses that start are actually successful. That's a pretty good number. Now, why? There's been some research that looked at it. Most of them started with more than 50 grand. And that's just because whatever you plan for is wrong. If you do a financial statement, if you hire the greatest MBA or, or professional program and accounting student to do your pro forma financial analysis, just know it's wrong. That's going to be wrong. Whatever they put down is going to be wrong. Now, they may have the best intentions, but you just can't forecast the future, right? So what companies need is a little bit extra cushion to be able to get them through because whatever forecast you do is wrong. If you're making stuff, it's better than if you're just selling a retail item or you're doing some kind of a service. It's not influenced by demographics. So it doesn't matter who you are, young, old, white, black, blue, yellow, green, doesn't matter where you come from, doesn't matter. Entrepreneurs come from every side. And we're seeing that in a lot of uh, some of the minorities African Americans are one of the fastest rising segments of, of entrepreneurs. Women, one of the fastest rising segments of entrepreneurs. Education, if you've actually gotten some education in the process, if you've gone through college, if you've gone through and taken entrepreneurship courses, if you've been part of entrepreneurial programs, certainly influences. And reasons for starting. One of the first, worst reasons for starting is I got laid off and I got to go find a job, so I'm going to start my own. Those are typically much less successful than I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put shoes on kids that don't have them, right? And I'm going to create a business that's going to make that work. Of the businesses that fail, it's almost always management. I guess that's why we have management departments and I have a job, right? Because we always screw things up, so we got to teach people how to fix it. But it started for the wrong reason. You get worn out, it's tough. You don't have a good market focus, family. You know, if you think about 
you go home and you say, honey, you know, I've got this great idea for a business. I'm going to quit my job. I'm not going to have any salary for a couple years. That takes a pretty supportive spouse to be able to go with that one, right? And I know some folks that are in that, in that, in that way, and in the first couple years it works pretty good, and after about the third year they're starting, you know, the spouse is like, hey, don't you think you ought to be contributing here a little bit, right? It's a tough road. Uh, and then there's macro influences, right? Neglect, fraud, disaster, some things that can come in that's completely out of your control. So how do we know what a successful entrepreneur? And when, I, and when I'm talking about entrepreneurship, I'm talking about not only entrepreneurship that goes out and starts a new venture, I'm talking about entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship that goes into a hospital or goes into another organization and makes that a better place. But what are the people that can be the change agents for those kinds of organizations? Or what are the people that can start new businesses? Passion for the business, right? You got to love what you're doing. Because in new ventures or entrepreneurship inside of existing organizations, it's going to be beyond the scope of what you're normally doing every day. So you got to be passionate about it. You got to have some kind of a product customer focus, right? There's got to be some end goal in mind that tells you I'm going to put shoes on kids, and this is going to make the world a better place. Tenacity despite failure. I've got a friend of mine that, that had a small business in Houston, and before he started, he and I are at the time were both kind of in the corporate world, and before he started, he went around and he just talked to probably 50 entrepreneurs. And we'd go to lunch every once in a while, and, and he would tell me the stories, and he said, it's unbelievable how many of these guys have started a business, made a buttload of money, then started another business, lost it all, then started a business, made a lot of money, started a business, lost it all. He said, it's unbelievable what that is. But they continued to go after it. And execution intelligence. You know, you can go back to Xerox, right? They created a very innovative uh, suite of products, but they didn't know how to capitalize on it. Now, Steve Jobs and Bill Gates did, and they got rich off of it. This is what we teach in the business school today. Um, when we think we don't teach business planning anymore, this is the business model canvas. And the business model canvas is all about you starting to think about your business in a much more holistic way than trying to write 40 pages of a business plan that nobody's ever going to read. So what we do is we teach how to create value propositions. What's the, the customer problem or pain that you're solving? If you're interested in this, it's uh, businessmodelgeneration.net. You can go get it for free. And you can download the PDF. What I do is I download the PDF and I send it over to Copy Corner and we get two foot by three foot posters made. And then I give those to my students as we go through the class. And as we go through the class, we put these up on the wall and we start doing post-it notes on here. And so what happens is that when you start thinking about your value proposition, my value proposition is I'm going to create the best hamburger in the world, right? That's a testable hypothesis. So every time you're putting something on here, it's a testable hypothesis. I think my customers are going to be males between the ages of 18 and 24. That's a testable hypothesis. You can go out and test that. I can go out and find a bunch of males between the ages of 18 and 24 and say, what do you think about my hamburger? This is the best one you ever had in your life? Or what do you think about this new software system? What do you think about this new network that I'm creating? What do you think about this new way of solving poverty in rural South Texas? Right? What is it that you can create? And so each one of these, what, kind, what relationship do your customers want? If you asked that of Barnes & Noble 15, 20 years ago, they would have said, my customers want to go in stores. And they want to read books. And they want to have a place where they can go read books. If you asked Amazon, they said, no, people don't want to do that. They want to buy this stuff off, off the line. They want to get it cheap. And who won that deal? So some of those relationships that you set up are very important initially early on. Revenue can come from lots of different places, subscriptions. Think about all the different kinds of models we see out there today in the internet. Premium models where you can go get stuff for free and then if you really like it, you can pay 10 bucks a month and get the, get the new stuff. So this is the way that we teach entrepreneurship from a, from a macro view. When I teach new ventures, but I also teach this to MBA students in the summer. And when I teach it to them, I teach it to them to go help reinvigorate existing organizations. Because the majority of those are not going to go out and start their new business. Right? They're going to go work. A lot of them are in Houston. A lot of them are working in the oil and gas industry. And they're trying to think about, 
our company has opportunities to spin out new products, spin out new divisions, and I want to be the one that's going to do that new division or new product. And so what I teach them to do is use this in a way that they can go to their management and say, listen, here's a value proposition, here's a market that we've identified, here's customers, and here's how we can go about getting after them. And then, typically what hopefully that happens is management will say, yes, let's go after that, or no, and then they'll go start their own business and do it. Thinking about value propositions, I had a, a friend of mine, and I read his blog religiously every week, because he's a friend of mine out of San Antonio. And so I went over to visit him a while back, and, and I say, man, you're doing some really good stuff on these blogs. He goes, I got to tell you. He goes, I don't write one of them. I said, what do you mean you don't write one of them? I'm reading this thing every week. He goes, no, I go to Blogmut. Blogmut, we work like a dog to fill up your blog. It's a guy that started a business that, that was solving a problem. Because what Lorenzo was telling me was, man, he goes, I know I'm supposed to be doing this blog, but it takes a lot of time. And I'm, and I'm running, and this guy is, he's running 24 hours a day, seven days a week. He is always gone. And he said, I had to do something. I was either not going to do this blog or I was starting to get quality issues. And he goes, I ran across this. It's a guy. I think he's in, he's in Asia somewhere. And he goes, I give him a topic. I want to write about social entrepreneurship. He goes, I get a blog next week. He goes, I want to write about new venture formation. Boom. He goes, I pay him 79 bucks a month. And I get four blogs a month. He goes, and I got a blog. And I said, I'm reading from some guy in Asia. He goes, well, it's my topics. <laughs> yeah. I guess that's how he justified it. But think about, this is a guy that solved a problem, right? That, and if it was a problem for Lorenzo, it's a problem for lots of other people. Any of you heard of In-N-Out Burger? You know, I just got done telling you about, you know, how lousy the restaurant business was. This company's making a killing. And it started out just as a Southern California uh, exercise, family business, but now it's in, it's in Texas as well and Arizona and some other places. But this is a company that looked at their business model and said, we're not going to follow the McDonald's model. It's a higher quality burger. They pay their employees about two to three dollars more an hour than what you get at McDonald's. They use locally grown produce. You, when you walk into the store, it's it's a uh, you can see everything. So you see them making the French fries. You see them creating the hamburgers. They've got two or three things on their menu. They got hamburgers and they got cheeseburgers and they got milkshakes and drinks. That's about it. French fries. Right? So you can get a double. You can get a triple. You can get a quadruple. You, that's it. And they've been a huge success. But they looked at that business model a little bit differently than everybody else, and it's been very successful. The other thing that we teach when we're talking about business models is if you wanted to go out and innovate inside your existing organization, or if you wanted to create a new business, we tell you to create a minimum viable product, which is the, the minimum amount of product that you can do, that you can create to get information from your customers. So don't create the whole donut with all the stuff on top of it. Create just enough to get the feedback. So if you were going to do a new website, all you need to do is put together, you don't need all the features and the functions and the back end stuff that you need. You want to create enough that you can get information from your customers and say, here's our, here's our new software platform. This is how we're going to create it. This is the advantage to you. And I want your feedback. And that then, there's, it's been well recorded that so many companies go out and develop their new processes, develop their new products, then they go out and identify and find out nobody wants to buy them. So we back that up in most of the literature today, thinking about the minimum viable product as a way to create uh, uh, the unnecessary expense of completely performing and developing a product. So the other thing that we teach, and it, and it works for Existing organizations as, as effectively, if almost not better, than new ventures is get out of the building. So many times we create, we create products, we create platforms, we create business plans, and we're just sure that there's going to be somebody out there that's going to want this thing. We're sure that there's going to be a new customer out there. The only way to go out and find is get out of the building. We do a, a program I'll talk about in a minute, and part of that program is we make and force the students to get outside and go talk to customers. 
get actual feedback. Now that's a little bit different than actually getting somebody to pull money out of their pocket and give it to you, but it's a start, right? You've got to start getting some initial customer feedback. So most of you don't remember this either. Alice says, Adventures in Wonderland. Uh, would you please tell me which way I ought to go, says Alice. The Cheshire cat says it depends on where you want to go. Alice says, I don't know. And the cat says it doesn't matter where you go. Okay. So think about that in terms of not only your career, but think in terms of entrepreneurship, right? Do you want to be innovative and creative because you can be, or do you want to just be another person that's sitting in the cubicle? So those folks that are going to be innovative and creative are very much in demand inside of organizations. We need people to be thinking differently. It's critical to our innovative country and our world. All right, so let me talk to you a little bit about, uh, Chris, how am I doing on time? Do I need to finish up by a certain, okay. All right, so what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about how you guys can get involved with uh, potential things that we do, uh, and I'd love to get a, a closer relationship with your school. We just finished up um, last weekend, I think, yeah, it was last weekend, uh, what we call three-day startup. Uh, three-day startup is a, uh, a program that we are doing twice a year. We do it in the fall and we do it in the spring. And there's our website, tamu.3daystartup.org, or you can go to our website, which is cnbe.tamu.edu. Either one of those you can get to it from. Uh, we take students, we'll take about 40 students. We take about half of them from computer science because those kids are, they're really weird, but they're really good. <laughs> I mean, these, these guys will just sit there and code 24 hours a day. And it's unbelievable what they create in 72 hours. We've created back office applications. We created websites, functional websites. We've got a student that is, uh, a student team that wanted to do online or, or uh, home delivery of groceries, which I thought was kind of a crazy idea, but they actually had customers over the weekend and were doing it. And they created a website to be able to do PayPal and have it paid for and the whole thing. They did, it, they did it by Sunday night. We start them on Friday afternoon. It's a, it's a neat deal, but you've got to commit the weekend to it. We need you there Friday, and you don't get back till Sunday afternoon. And I guarantee you that computer science kids, they're sleeping there. They're, they're bringing their sleeping bags, and they're laying on the floor. This is what we do. We start out 3 o'clock on a Friday. We have dinner. We create the ideas that are going to be pitched for that weekend, select the teams. Sunday morning, they're out talking to customers. Um, Sunday night, we feed you to death. So tons of Red Bull, tons of Snickers bars, everything, just keep you going. Uh, we do practice pitches that night, and by um, Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening, we bring in uh, investors, and you're actually pitching your uh, new ventures to investor panels. So uh, they we're involved with Three, three Day Startup, which is a national organization. We have them come in and help us with the mentoring of that. We bring in mentors from all around the state uh, and the community. Uh, lots of folks come in to help us with this program, and the students love it. It's a, it's a really innovative, creative weekend. You get to meet. One of the things we talk about in, in the video is that it's probably the only time you're going to get so many majors together except at a football game. It's just a really neat opportunity. Um, for you, uh, most of your graduate students, right? Uh, for you guys, uh, we have a series of courses that you're welcome to take if it fits into your program. Um, there's no prereqs on any of these. We, we make it open. I teach the new venture uh, formation class. I get students from engineering and construction science and, and all over the place. I get students from here. Um, we have a class on technology commercialization, innovation, creativity, leadership, financing, adventures, and negotiations, etc. We have a certificate program. You need 12 hours, but if you just want to take one of the classes or you find something of interest, uh, we'd love to have you guys come over and, and uh, participate with us. We do a program in the summer. I don't know what your guys' summer's like, but if it happens to be uh, open, um, I'd love to have uh, some of you guys. We get, we get, we've been getting quite a few students from the Bush School in this program. You go to uh, Cape Town, uh, you're actually going to be working with entrepreneurs that are in the townships, and the township outside of Cape Town is a million people, so it's not like some dinky little affair. Uh, Cape Town is probably as good a, uh, is as nice a, a resort city as you'll find anywhere in the world, uh, and the townships are a real dichotomy. There's some, some abject poverty, but there's some that are doing really well, and so what we do is we pair you up with 
um, some entrepreneurs that are just struggling in their business. So it might be a, a lady that's got a catering business, that's living in a tin shack, that's got six kids depending on her catering business, or it might be a, another lady that has a tax business with a bricks and mortar business that's looking to expand into another part of the township. So there's a significant opportunity and we try to pair you up with one or the other. You become consultants. We teach you a consulting methodology. It's called the Supporting Emerging Entrepreneurs a Consulting Process. Uh, where you have some classes in the morning, and then in the afternoon you're working with your uh, entrepreneurs. This is not a sightseeing trip. Um, most of the uh, folks that come back say it's a life-changing experience, but they've never worked so hard. I mean, because you become invested with the people that you're trying to help. And so it's, 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 a, uh, it, it's just an amazing, I just had an information on one of the students was there talking about it, and he said it's, it's just incredible what he learned, and, and the relationships that he got with folks from other schools, and the relationship that he got from, uh, from the people that, that were in South Africa that he helped. Uh, many of the, we've done this for, I think this is our fourth or fifth year, uh, many of the students that have gone through the program are still talking to their, to, their, uh, to their clients that they had in South Africa, so it's really a neat program. Uh, we're still accepting applications. Uh, I'd happy to talk to somebody if you're interested in that. I think I brought some more. The program is in early June, ends in mid-July, so it's six weeks. Many of our students will stay a week before or after and hang around South Africa and do some things. But that's the official program. All of the stuff is on our website, cost-wise and applications and all those kinds of things. The Aggie 100 is a really neat program. We recognize the 100 fastest growing Aggie owned and operated businesses. Uh, we bring them in. Uh, next year will be our 10th year. It represents um, folks from all the colleges. So I hope to start seeing some health science folks up here now since we're all part of one big happy family. Uh, but I think the one thing that you can, you can see is that we get students from all over, or we get entrepreneurs and businesses from all over the place. I've got a, a guy on my uh, advisory council that graduated from Ocean Engineering and he owns a business that does dock levelers for Fortune 500 companies. So, you know, it doesn't necessarily matter what your, what your undergraduate degree is in some cases. Business and engineering probably are the majority of the ones that we see. It's typically about 35 or 40 percent for each one of those. But I think the real exciting thing for us is that we get participation from all the other colleges as well. We are in our 10th year. I think another interesting thing is to think about how much economic activity is created by entrepreneurs. Just the nominees, the people that, that apply to our program had almost $20 billion in revenue last year. So those Aggies are out making some significant contributions to the economy. We also do a program for disabled veterans in the summer. Uh, if any of you are around in the summer and interested in this, we'd love to have you help. We bring in uh, about 25 disabled veterans. They have to be on active duty since 9-11. They have to have a service-connected disability, and they've got to want to start their own business. And we bring them in, and we put them through a three-week online program. And then we bring them onto campus for eight days. It's completely free to them. We go out and raise money for this program so there's no cost to any of the veterans. Uh, and it's just an amazing program. Uh, they take a lot out of it. We do lots of mentoring in the evenings on their business plans. Uh, and we're always looking for some extra help in that one. Uh, this is for your big idea. I know you guys all have big ideas. Uh, we have a program called the Ideas Challenge. It's uh, the Raymond Ideas Challenge, because the, the Raymond family supports this. Uh, we give away $8,000 for your big idea. What we ask you to do is come up with what's your, what's your idea. We ask you, it's not an onerous process, it's a thousand words. Talk about the pitch, what's the real idea. We ask you to think about what competitors are out there, why is the world going to be a better place if this is done. Not for profits or just as acceptable as for profit ideas. Um, all the ideas come in, then we have those judged, and the top 40 ideas then we bring into the business school and we have a competition where you'll present your idea to two different folks. It's on dead day. Um, and we'll bring in about 80 to 100 judges to campus. So it's bankers and lawyers and CPAs and venture capitalists and private equity guys and you name it. We get all kinds of folks to come in and help us with this. And then you pitch your idea so you get some really good feedback on that. Uh, then we have a networking reception, so it's a great opportunity for you to meet a bunch of new folks as well. So strengthen those weak ties that you got. Uh, another thing that, that could be very interesting for you guys, if you actually are thinking of, of doing a startup, is we have a, uh, 
research accelerator that's in Research Park. It's called Startup Aggieland. Uh, this is for students that are actually working on starting up businesses. We've, we've right now, I think it's up to about 30. 30 different student teams are working on starting businesses over there. And they come from online grocery deliveries. So we've got a lot of software programs that are being done over there too, right now. So we get a lot of engineering students, a lot of business students, a lot of liberal arts students. i uh, love to have some of you guys come over and participate in that. Okay, real quick, i got a real quick video for you. Okay, so there's no excuse for you guys. Go out and innovate, make the world a better place, and uh, I'd be happy to take any questions or answer anything if you got, or I'll be around here for a few minutes, I guess. Anybody got any? Yes, ma'am. If you have a new idea, say like a product design idea, um, how do you prevent like, copyright issues? Well, copyright's easy. Uh, you put the copyright bug on it. And, uh, or you can register it, so it's $30 at USPTO.gov. Um, you know, one of the things, and I get a lot of students that ask me that question about, you know, people stealing their ideas, and it's, and it's not that that's out of the realm of possibility, but it's pretty unlikely. There's nobody that's going to be as excited about your idea as you are. And, and if you saw, if you remember, what one of the things of the, the characteristics of sex of entrepreneurs was execution intelligence. Lots of folks have ideas. It's the ones that get it done. Is very, very different. Now, copyright's very easy to do. Trademark's very easy to do. Uh, patents are a little more difficult. You need more money, more time. You need a patent lawyer. But even so, even all that intellectual property, it's only as good as your ability to protect it, right? So if, if you find somebody that's infringing on your patent, you got to go sue them. So you got to have the wherewithal to be able to sue them. So quite often, I'm, I'm much more interested that you really develop that idea. And at some point, intellectual property is very important, especially on technological uh, innovations. But nobody's going to be as, as uh, passionate about your idea as you are. But it's easy to do a copyright. Anybody else? Go make the world a better place. Thank you, guys. <laughs>